Um, the presentation that uh, I have, uh, it touches on a lot of points that have already been covered. So I'll try not to belabor some of those. Um, <clears throat> We, uh, within our laboratory, um, we, we use human figure modeling uh, for training and simulation and also for immersive environments. Uh, uh, but the group that I'm with uh, specifically, uh, we use human figure modeling for workspace analysis. Uh, so human figure modeling is really a tool uh, that we use to evaluate uh, systems to see if they meet the uh, human factors requirement. We're an organization that's sort of the uh, Army's honest broker to uh, ensure that systems do meet uh, human factors requirements. <coughs> um, most of, a lot of, a lot of people consider uh, human figure modeling uh, just the software, but there are many elements that go into uh, being able to use that tool uh, to do your workspace analysis. It's just that you actually have the software, but uh, the anthropometry data, what, what uh, population are you going to assess? Uh, also, uh, modeling techniques. Uh, a lot of times you, you have to take the software and uh, develop your own techniques for uh, doing the assessment. Uh, CAD data translation has been touched on already. Uh, that's a major issue. Uh, posture data. And there are other uh, uh, elements that would go in here as well. So maybe like uh, uh, the uh, vision. If you're wearing a mask, you might want to want to have uh, data that reflects the restrictive uh, visibility or if you're wearing, particularly if you're wearing equipment, um, protective equipment, there's a, a <coughs> range of motion limitations and all that would go into uh, 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 this tool to do the workspace analysis. Um, you've seen a, a slide similar to this that uh, Brian has shown, uh, <clears throat> where there's, you, you have to accommodate a wide range of body types in uh, uh, any system. But one of the problems is that uh, for requirements, uh, most of the requirements language is still written in terms of 5th through 95th percentile. That really doesn't mean anything when you say 5th percentile or 95th percentile, unless you're talking about one body dimension. So when you, when you use 5th and 95th percentile language in your requirements. Um, it's been demonstrated uh, uh, a long time ago that you're going to wind up uh, accommodating a, a, a lot uh, smaller population than the 90% of the population that is what is intended to be accommodated. So, um, <clears throat> One of the approaches, or one of the, one of the areas where human figure modeling can be very useful, is to use a boundary mannequin approach. And we work with uh, Natick to develop a set of body or boundary mannequins for uh, first for a system called the Future Combat System (FCS). And uh, this was a set of mannequins, actually, uh, with uh, some projected data out to the year 2015, which was when uh, the first of these vehicles was scheduled to be uh, fielded. <clears throat> and the, uh, the other challenge, or the other hurdle uh, that's unique to, uh, or <coughs> unique to military systems versus, say, uh, commercial uh, automobiles is, of course, the uh, equipment. So we developed uh, models of the uh, clothing and equipment to put on the, uh, the figure. Um, we find that, the, the, as you can see, wearing a hydration pack, uh, armor, body armor, some of the load carrying vest, uh, that bulk makes up a lot more difference than just the differences between, um, say, uh, the uh, fifth or 50th percentile male 
chest depth and the 95th percentile chest depth. So if you don't take this clothing and equipment into consideration, you'll wind up with a system that uh, doesn't accommodate the intended uh, target population. Uh, the other challenge to this, uh, if you just scan the equipment, if you scan a, uh, a subject with the clothing and equipment on, you wind up with a concrete statue. So we had to develop a, a method to segment the clothing and equipment, to put it on the figure so that you could still have a figure that was interactive. Uh, but this is a very labor intensive process, so that's one of the challenges so even developing clothing and equipment in this manner um, and, and fitting them to a set of boundary magnets takes a long time uh, so one of the things we did uh, again working with uh, Natick was um, taking a, a subject that they had scanned with the, the clothing and equipment on and obtaining that same clothing and equipment and the, the dimensions of the subject that was was scanned, build the human figure model, and uh, digitized individual pieces of equipment, put them on the human figure model, and uh, there you can see uh, the uh, Jack model with the clothing and equipment superimposed over that is the scan. Um, it was a pretty good match, uh, although you can see we modeled the clothing and equipment <coughs> as um, smooth objects. So we don't model the, uh, uh, the draping of the clothing and equipment. And you can see that's what sticks out on the legs is some of the, the, uh, the folding and draping of the, the clothing and equipment. So it's not an ideal method by any means, but it's better than a figure without any clothing and equipment. Um, I mentioned uh, developing some workarounds. Um, the, uh, for, for military systems, uh, particularly vehicles, um, a, a visibility or, or a field of view is a major issue. So it's not only being able to see close into the vehicle, particularly uh, with IEDs being an issue or uh, driving off the side of the road because you can't see close enough into the vehicle, but also having upward visibility so you can spot rooftop snipers. Now, some of this is augmented with cameras and, and uh, other technology, but uh, you have to develop a, uh, a technique for showing what that uh, visibility region would be. And those tools, even though they're not in the software, you, you have to develop workarounds to sort of be able to show where, where the visible regions would, would be. There's a this is an example where we're looking at placement of displays. Where, where would be the optimal placement of displays in a vehicle that would um, be well suited for the entire range of the population? Uh, CAD, uh, I'm not going to labor this uh, too much because this has already been hashed out. But, uh, uh, because we're not a developer of the equipment, we depend on, on getting the CAD file sent to us, and uh, a lot of times we either don't get the files that don't exist, or we get incomplete files, or files that are not optimized. Uh, so this has been a, a real challenge for us to get uh, CAD data that, uh, that's in a usable format, that's optimized, and that we can put, um, articulate all the pieces that need to be articulated, such as uh, seats, uh, steering wheels, or uh, it's an aircraft, have uh, flight controls that are articulated. So there's an example of, uh, this was a Humvee that we had digitized, and um, the, the level of detail that you see in this model, uh, there's no drivetrain, um, it's a, a fairly simple uh, model, uh, we don't have all the nuts and bolts and screws and, and other level of detail that you would typically see in a CAD model that was, uh, uh, that would come from a developer. So that's it, that's my presentation.